I am Nick McClellan. I'm from After Hours Productions, all the way over from Tifton, Georgia. We're about three hours south of Atlanta. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about my video production company, what we do, how I got into it, some of the things that I've learned over the years that I've been doing it, and possibly some insight into ways to make my business better and ways to make your business better as we move forward together in, in uh, being able to establish what the videography business really is and where the industry at large is, is headed out. <clears throat> well, first I'll tell you how I got started in it. Uh, I came from a background of playing in bands, um, owned a lot of equipment, went from that into mobile disc jockey work because I could make more money, uh, been doing mobile disc jockey work and continue to do mobile disc jockey work for the past 30 years. Really began to be an opportunity presenting itself to not only book the DJs at weddings, but also to be able to look at photography, videography, rentals for anything from candelabras. So I started looking uh, at various ways to make more money within what I was already doing. And so I began to see, well, some of the things were gonna require a lot of additional inventory. Some of them were services that I wouldn't be able to provide alongside of what I was already doing. And so videography was something that I had messed around with as my kids were younger. So I thought, you know, this would be kind of an exciting thing to at least begin to experiment with. And so I started off with some three megapixel Sony A1U cameras. The, uh, at the time, we're shooting 1080p HD, and everybody thought, wow, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, uh, you know, I started shooting with those around the house to kind of get familiar with it and was able to do some pretty nice looking stuff. Had a lot to learn. So as probably the same as many of you, you go to YouTube, you start watching to see what other people are doing, what the trends are, um, what types of equipment, what types of lenses, what types of everything that you can use <clears throat> to be able to produce a video that looks worth watching. So I began to start shooting just little things around the house and I would let my friends and families watch them to be able to get their opinion on what they liked about what I did and what they didn't like about it. And then I would begin to compare it to contemporaries that were already in the business. And when I got to a point where I felt like, you know, I have a quality product, I began pitching it within the business model that I already had. Now, for those of you that are scholarly, you'll find out that's inline diversification. That's taking something within your product line already and expanding upon it. And I was already doing weddings. We were doing a couple of weddings to four or six weddings a weekend based on how busy the season was. And so... I just look for opportunities within that to begin telling brides, hey, not only do we do mobile disc jockey work, not only do we rent video screens and projectors, you know, we can put together slideshows for the, the reception. We can take all your pictures and put them together uh, to make a slideshow presentation. And we can also shoot the video of the wedding. Well, hey, I was surprised, but we began booking some business and things worked pretty well. We were producing a fairly decent quality of product compared to what else was in this area. Uh, and we were reasonably priced to begin with because I really didn't know what to charge. I just knew that if I could make more money and I could pay my equipment off and be able to have something left over, that it was a good business model. Not really understanding all of the pricing structuring and that sort of thing. And that was about five years ago. <clears throat> and as you guys are well aware, uh, the standard old cameras kind of went by the wayside when the, the DSLRs came out. And when they came out, it changed everything. So I found myself about three years ago really in this awkward place where I needed to upgrade the equipment because I, I had one disastrous scenario that occurred and I learned my lesson very quickly. I made the mistake of mixing uh, a DSLR with my three megapixel Sony camera in the same video shoot. <clears throat> and so the bride, without realizing what had actually taken place, she was sitting down talking with me afterwards after she had paid me for it. And she said, the film looked great, but I didn't understand in this one part right here why it got so grainy looking. And the reality was is that I had used the footage of the DSLR so much through the footage uh, that when I went to the Sony, there was such a dramatic difference that she noticed it. And so I had to explain I was on two cameras. So anyway, that's kind of how I got started in the business. Um, what I want to be able to, to talk with you guys about is really how to take what you love to do. And I really hope that because you're doing this, it is out of the fact that you have a love for it, you have a passion for it, because I truly believe that anything that you love to do that you would do without even getting paid, you'll be really good at it. So for me, 
what was going to make me be good at it was to love it. And so I began to really appreciate what I could do with the camera. I began to find ways to more and more enjoy everything about what I was doing. And so now it was just a matter of getting good at it. So I began continuing to practice, and that's something that I can't emphasize enough, that it really is necessary that you know your equipment because you're going to be confronted with so many different circumstances when you actually shoot a video, whether it's a wedding or whether it's something on location. You'll be confronted with things that you probably weren't prepared for, and automatic setting doesn't always work. <clears throat> so it's, it's really necessary that you know your equipment, be able to understand how to put things together, and artistically, there are times when you would want to use your camera in a way that might not be the conventional way to use it, but it comes out with really good results. So I think one of the important things in knowing your equipment is know how to modify things. You know, being able to do out of focus shots and catching the sunlight at a certain way and sometimes, you know, having people spin sparklers and open the aperture so that it's really slow and you can see a number or a you know, a heart or whatever it is that you might want to do. We've done all those tricks in producing wedding videos. So let's talk a little bit about preparing your shoot before you actually start the shoot. What are some of the things you need to do? First off, you need to determine what the client wants. That is super, super important. So being able to talk with your client, determine what their expectations are, has been probably the biggest learning thing for me is because I want to come out to every camera shoot with all of my equipment and just shoot everything up and then come back and edit it. <clears throat> and that's great, but you're going to end up with a lot of personnel on staff. You're going to end up with a lot of time and a lot of footage to have to go through. And it may be that the client really didn't want all of that and you just spent all of the money that you could have made in profit. You just spent it in paying personnel and in time in the studio actually editing the footage. So, uh, Let's look at how to prepare the shoot ahead of time. Talk to the bride. Talk to whomever you're shooting for. I, I'm specifically doing weddings more than anything else right now. We do commercial application also, but specifically I'm doing wedding shoots. And so we talk to the bride and we try to find out of the packages that we offer, what is it that you're looking for? Are you looking for just a summary of the wedding? You want a highlight reel which just shows who's there, what we did at the wedding, the highlights of the kiss, then we're going to go to the reception. We're going to see bits and pieces of the first dance. We want to see a little bit of what the environment looks like there, you know, what the table settings are, what food we served, what our flowers look like, you know, to be able to go through all of those things. And, and then to be able to come back to the bouquet toss, the garter toss, and the exit strategy. Okay, that is one package. With that, you can honestly shoot that whole thing with one video camera because most DSLRs right now will shoot 12 minutes continuously. I do understand that the new ones are coming out and they're going to be able to do 30 minutes. So if you haven't bought your camera yet, I would wait for the new ones to come out. But anyway, you can at least get 12 minute snippets and that's plenty enough with a few interruptions to be able to shoot a great majority of what's taking place. So really when you're shooting a short film of that nature, and that's what I call it, you're trying to get those artistic looks, you know, those spots where they're looking at each other and it's just such a cute or a sweet or a loving expression that you want to capture that moment. Or those times when <clears throat> the sun is just right or the moon is setting just right or the wind is moving the trees or drops of moisture coming off of a flower. Anything that is really cool and very artistic, you want to get those shots in there um, because that is going to be the thing that kind of sets your video apart from everything else. But you want to talk to the bride. You want to find, okay, is this what you're looking for? Do you want just this little short synopsis of what's taking place or are you looking for something that's more documentary in style? <clears throat> documentary style would be, we're going to come in and we're going to talk to the major players. We're going to talk to mom. We're going to talk to dad. We're going to find out about the bride. Then we're going to talk to mom and dad and we're going to find out about the groom. Then we're going to talk to the bride and groom to find out how they met each other and what set them apart from other people that they had dated. You know, What are the characteristics that they admire most in each other. Those sorts of things. More documentary style where you're trying to gather information from them. And then we go into the wedding. We would shoot it with at least two cameras. Most of the time we shoot three cameras because when you're shooting with uh, two of the, the DSLRs, what ends up happening is sometimes you synchronize them and so they're so close together that you could potentially hit the start and stop button at the same time and leave a gap in your film. Um, I use a GoPro. I, I have one GoPro that I stick in the bushes right up at the front try to get it positioned so I'm getting the faces of the bride and groom because often is the case 
you can't get a camera in there if they're up against a wall uh, or they're against a pond on a dock or any of those things where it's really difficult to get that facial shot and your other two cameras end up being back shots all the time or side profile shots. It's good to have that one. And the other fact is, is that the GoPro runs continuously. So the audio track is often a really good synchronizer of everything there. Um, so the next thing would be is being able to capture everything exactly as it occurs, trying to point the camera at the action that is most important at that moment. That's your documentary style. The reception, again, pretty much in its entirety, we're going to get all of the first dance. We're going to get all of the first dances with everybody that dances. Then we would go through and get all of the bouquet toss information, all of the garter toss information, everything having to do with any toasts, any prayers, anything that happens that would be significant to the bride or groom. We want to make sure we capture it from its entirety and we're actually playing the audio of the actual event. We're not setting that to music. In the short film, as you've seen if you've looked at our website afterhoursproductions.com, we set the little short clips to music. <clears throat> and in that, you know, the clips are only going to last as long as the music is going to last and it's also going to be as heart provoking as possible as we're, you know, we want to get that emotional feel. Uh, I, I love it when a dad gets the video first and he says, man, I just sat in my car and cried because it was just so touching. You know, that tells me we did a good job and that's really kind of the oomph that I'm looking for when I'm shooting a short. But when we're doing the documentary styles, we're really just looking for content. We want to give all the content that we can let them you know do what they want to do with it they want to see everybody and everything we're going to give it to them. we do charge differently for the two so there again we'll talk about pricing in a little while <clears throat> and then the last thing is is we're just going to give like raw footage which is no editing we just go in and shoot one two three cameras whatever they do we give them the card at the end of the night and they do their own editing and we charge a different fee for that so you can kind of charge based on what you want to do. You can charge based on the number of interviews that you do. Like we do a lot of wedding interviews during the reception. We'll go and talk to grandmothers and mothers and dads and friends and the bridegroom. We'll talk to anybody that'll talk to us and we'll just ask them questions. You know, what did you think about the wedding? How do you know the bride and groom? What's, what's a fun story that you have about the bride or groom? Do you know how they met? We do those sorts of things. And of course, we'll interview the bride and groom to find out, you know, how they met and those types of things as well. Uh, so that's how we then we're selling the job to the bride to get them to determine what they want so we know how we're going to set up for the job. So the number of personnel and the number of uh, and the pieces of equipment that we're going to need are going to be indicative on the type of shoot we're doing. Then the other thing that you have to, uh, to be able to determine is what is the setting? <clears throat> are we looking at an outdoor setting? Like you can look at my window right here and you can see super bright outside. I was going to go outside and shoot but I'm doing this real cheesy just off my laptop because I don't have time to edit it. Um, so I was just looking for a site where the sun wasn't blaring in my eyes and, you know, I could be comfortable. And so I'm comfortable in this chair. So, you know, being able to determine the location. Are you going to be shooting where you need uh, external light, where you're having to bring your own lighting? Or is it all outdoors and it's going to be really sunny and you don't need it, but you might need filters or you might need some type of a lens cover so that you don't get any glare on it? Or is it a combination where it's both? It's an evening wedding where they're going to get the sunset in it and uh, you're going to need to shoot with a camera that shoots you know, at a really low uh, lighting level to, to produce a really nice quality video. And then when you move in, uh, you're going to be shooting off of some type of a fluorescent light or something that doesn't look good. And do you need to supplement with a 3200K light or a 5200K light? You know, these are things that you need to know ahead of time. And you need to charge accordingly because I think one thing that happens is you quote the job as a package and then you get into the job when you find out the details of it and you begin to realize, oh man, this is going to be way more involved than what I thought. And trying to go back to the bride or the mother of the bride after the fact, once you've already quoted the job, it's really not too cool. They don't enjoy that because they budget based on what you quote. And so if you do that, suck it up and move forward. All right, marketing, <clears throat> marketing the job. You know, that's one of the things, how do you get to the point that you can get to where you can afford to do all these other things and you know what equipment you need, you gotta be able to market yourself. So what's some of the ways that you actually can produce advertising? The web is really good. Uh, one of the things that I do is I use a facility called Gigmasters <clears throat> to help do my bookings. Um, and I promote myself as a wedding DJ there and then I use that as a springboard 
I use that as my springboard to be able to get into talking about videography and the other services that we rent. We do a lot of rentals at weddings also. So being able to find a site that is already booking the type of thing that you're doing, uh, you know, there are videography sites out there, I'm sure, um, or you may want to just go to a DJ site as well and be able to hook up with another DJ, look, at, look on a website and find out, you know, who are the top DJs in the area where you are, go to them and work out a package deal where they can book you <clears throat> as well as book themselves and pay them a 20% commission for booking. If you get six, eight, ten DJs that are willing to do that, you don't care who's DJing the party, they're promoting you as well, and you're able to go out and generate business without you having to personally go meet brides. So that's a great way to do it. One of the other things you can do is floral shops. You know, brides are going to have flowers at the wedding. So go to all your florists and your floral shops in town and in the areas that you want to go into. Drop off business cards. I like the little postcards that have some really sharp pictures from some of the weddings that you've done and you may have to get with the photographer if you don't shoot photography you only do videography but get some of the really nice photos to, to crop over there and it's great if it's somebody that you actually did and not a stock footage so if somebody asks you can genuinely say yeah this was from one of the you know the weddings that we did a facility that we shot in so that they actually see some of the quality of your work the other thing is being able to show videos um, it was amazing to me when i started posting videos to my website how many people started looking at them and watching them you know whether it's a bride and groom and their family or whether it's other videographers looking at it or whether it's just potential brides um, looking I, I don't know but you know we've got over 25,000 views on our website over the, the time period looking at the videos that we're doing so that's exciting to know that there are that number of people that are potential clients at any given point um, for a lot of different things so uh, that's the other thing that I do. Um, I go to wedding planners, people that actually do event planning and wedding planning. Uh, they charge a fee for doing it, and it's great if you can get in their graces and give them a, a 10 or 20% commission depending on what you feel comfortable with with them. A lot of times they don't make the final say. They can pitch it a little bit, but they're not going to do the legwork and the paperwork behind it, where when you're dealing with the DJ, he's already accustomed to cutting an agreement and to add you on. It's not a big deal. Some of the event planners do or, or don't actually issue contracts. They just kind of say, you pay me this and I'll show up. So if you do with them, you might not want to pay them as much and you might want to do your own agreement, which I guess is part of the whole thing of dealing with them is cutting an agreement so that you know what's in writing. Uh, I've had issues with that where the expectations were different from what the reality was. Uh, the other thing is writing letters. I have not found that to be very effective, perfectly honest. I used to, you know, back in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, I could write letters and send promotional flyers out and that sort of thing to people. And there seemed to be a pretty good degree of success with that. I would get some callbacks, but people are so inundated with email and letters right now that most people don't even open the envelope. And when you figure that it costs about 50 cents a letter to mail something out and probably a dollar to produce it, you're looking at a buck and a half to send it to a client who threw it in the garbage. You have to justify how many you're going to send out to know whether or not it's even worth the effort. If you get a 10% recall uh, as far as people touching base with you after you've sent out a letter, so you're getting 10 people out of every 100, that might be well worth it. You know? But if you're only getting one out of every 100, you may determine it's not worth it, depending on the, the price package that you're most likely looking at. Um, going back and being able to talk a little bit more about the pricing. I think this is really important for a lot of folks that are breaking into the business or for folks that have been in it a while, is that there's really a, a misnomer out there that you can just get lots and lots of dollars from the videography business. Same thing with DJ business. Everybody thinks, oh wow, this is a great business. Everybody should jump into it. <clears throat> but the reality of it is, is that the equipment's fairly expensive. Um, I don't have a ton of money. I probably have less than $20,000 in my videography equipment. Um, so it's not super expensive to get into by comparison to, you know, opening up a store downtown with inventory. You know, you really don't have a whole lot. But at the same token, you want to be able to make enough so that you make a profit fairly quickly. You know, if you have to go more than 12 months before you pay for your equipment, then you're probably not charging enough. So it's kind of a rule of thumb. Look at how many uh, events that you should be doing. And by reality, you should do 20 events to pay for your equipment. So that's kind of a starting point. So if you're only buying, you know, an $800 SLR camera and an $1,100 lens, and you've just got, you know, about two grand in it, 
then you shouldn't be charging more than about a hundred dollars a pop to be able to do things. You know, that's just kind of a ballpark. But if you've got twenty thousand dollars in there and you gotta pay yourself a profit and pay your personnel, you know, you're gonna have to charge more. Right now we charge a thousand dollars um to shoot a wedding and that's with three cameras and we they can choose the documentary style wedding or they can do the short story wedding with interviews. We kind of do that, or they can do a combination of the two, and we'll base the price. So the pricing goes anywhere from $350 up to about $2,000, depending on what all they want. So that's just kind of the way we price our stuff out. But I look at what I have invested in it, how much time it's going to take to do it, what they're actually asking for, how many copies of what we're doing and about the amount of editing. Like uh, I've heard of people that would do dance recitals and dance recitals can be, oh, one of the worst <laughs> videography experiences possible because of the number of people uh, that are in these things. They often are, are like a three hour matinee in the, in the afternoon and then they'll do another two or three hour performance at night because you're having to deal with so many kids and so many parents that it never ends up being one. And so you're trying to shoot multiple opportunities and it just ends up with a ton of footage and an awful lot of time to be able to put it all together. So if you're going to do that, even if it's just a one camera shoot, you still got to handle all that footage. So <clears throat> it's one of the things to consider when you're, if you're pricing any job, even outside of weddings, commercial shots, it's what's involved in it. Also business pricing versus individual pricing. Um, when I look at weddings, I'm looking at something that pretty well applies to at least every family. Somebody's getting married in every family uh, at some point in time. So it's going to be common enough that I should be reasonable in my pricing because I'm pricing to a mass market. When I'm dealing specifically with a business, it's not the sort of thing that the business is going to come back to over and over and over again, most likely. So in that setting, I'm going to charge a little bit more for it because I want them to be happy with the product. I want to have enough built into it that I have to, if I have to go back and help them correct something or shoot something again, I don't feel like, hey, it's not worth it because I don't have, an, I don't have enough money in the project. So that's part of it. Uh, one of the other places that I meant to mention was uh, wedding destination areas. Big deal. In this area, uh, we have a, a great wedding facility called Gin Creek and there are a couple of other facilities around here that have just recently opened a peach barn and, the Georgia Agri Center. There's a lot of really rustic buildings that are being converted into wedding destinations. It's a terrific idea to print up some of your cards and your uh, postcards and carry them over to them and also ask for the opportunity to maybe set up a TV and put your video running in a loop over there so if somebody wants to see some of the quality of your work they can actually do that or of course put your website out so that they can see it that way. So that's another one of the things that I think is, uh, is really so let's talk about uh, addressing the client a little bit. You know, when we're talking to the client, what is it that you're trying to say? And how are you trying to deal with them? Like in our scenario right now, I'm doing all the talking. I'm getting no feedback whatsoever. But that's really not a good way to deal with your client. Most of the time, uh, you need to hear your client's heart, what their desires are, and you listen. And then you can base your package on what the client is saying. Um, is the client a real talkative person? If they're a very talkative person, then they're probably going to want to be on camera. And so you need to pitch them a package that says, hey, we'll interview you and let you tell your story. If the client's very quiet and reserved, then they're going to be more interested in seeing what other people have to say. And so I would talk about interviewing other people to get input to them. Uh, the other side would be the documentary. If, if they're a quiet person, they're going to want to see, you know, they're going to take things in more so than somebody who wants to be the one in the spotlight. So that's really important. Um, you know, people like to hear you say their name as well. So make sure that whoever comes in and introduces themselves, you know, you write that name down so you can continue to address them and say, you know, hey, John, I really like that idea. Hey, Sue, that's a phenomenal way to look at things. You know, I constantly spin back to them the things that they're saying to me so that I make sure one that I understand what they're saying and two is it builds a camaraderie because they're like man this guy remember my name so that's that's a good thing uh, the other thing is it's repeat what they say back to you as far as their ideas so that you make sure you're clear on what they're expecting so if a, if a mother says you know I want to be able to get everything in the wedding okay that's real that's real vague so what's important is that you say, okay, when you say everything in the wedding, are you saying 
you want us to put cameras all over the place and you want to capture the audience's response and what's going on on the stage and the lapel mics all over the pastors and the bride and then you want to just capture everything so that we can look at it from a bunch of different angles. Are you saying you just really want one camera that's spread out wide that views the whole area? Those are two dramatically different things. And so it's important that when you repeat back to them, you repeat back their concept, but then you explain to them what that entails to either meet the need the way you perceive it or what you think they're perceiving um, the manner is. And that's real important because clarification will save you a lot of grief. There's nothing worse than being through with the shoot, coming with a product that you're pleased with, only to find out that you did not meet the need of the wedding person. Uh, I'll give you a personal story. I shot a dance recital. I don't like dance recitals, but I shot a dance recital. And it was somebody that I knew personally. I wanted to do a really good job. So uh, I put three cameras up. I put a GoPro to catch everything. And then I put uh, two Canon D1s up, uh, shooting from various angles to be able to get everything there. And so when we actually shot the, uh, when we actually shot the dance recital, I was cutting back and forth, you know, getting the best angles in every one of the shots. And man, I was really pleased. I took all their audio and dubbed it in on top of my reels. Um, when they showed videos, like they did a So You Think You Can Dance, and uh, they would show videos up on the screen uh, or did a video interview with their seniors, I would always get the actual footage and dub it down onto my reels so that everything looked first rate, very sharp. And I was really pleased with the result. I had about 45 hours of editing into it, carried it to the client in like six days after the shoot, which, you know, I had been told if I could get it within the next three months, they'd be happy. I did it in six days. So I really turned up everything that I could, gave her the product with full expectations that she was just going to salivate over it. And the reality is she was not happy at all. And I'm like, I don't get it. She's like, I wanted the full stage all the time. And you were cutting in and out so we couldn't see what the routine looked like. The difference was she was concerned from a choreographer standpoint of view what the overall impact of the dance was. I was looking at it from a standpoint of view little girls want to be seen by their mamas and their grandmamas and their daddies and so I want to get as many close-ups on the dancers as are possible so that the parents and the grandparents will be happy. We had two different concepts of what was going to be considered good and so as a result of that I made the client happy and believe me I was upset too. Um, I didn't go back and edit it because I was working off commission, but nonetheless. And she sold more videos that year than she had before. So I was able to make the money that I needed, but I didn't get asked to come back again. So sometimes it happens. So it's very important that you sit down and you discuss all these things. Um, don't be critical of bad ideas if you know technically it won't work out, <clears throat> like they want you to stand in the pond and shoot with your SLR to capture that one good shot. You know, you have to be able to say, listen, I'm willing to do these things, but you have to assume the responsibility for any damage to the equipment if they want you to do something that you know is probably not a good idea. If they want you to shoot from the top of the house and shoot down, you know, anything that you deem is either unsafe to your equipment or unsafe to you, you don't want to go there. That wouldn't be a good idea. So these are all things in dealing with the client that are great to discuss ahead of time. Uh, another thing that would be is being able to discuss the pricing with the client. I think it's a good idea, and I hate to be stereotypical when I look at clients, but the reality is I look at what they drive up in. You know, if somebody drives up in a Mercedes or a BMW, I'm going to assume that I'm going to be selling a nicer package and that I don't have to get beat up on the price. If somebody drives in in a 1963 pickup truck that looks like they live on the dirt road, then I have to say this may be a little bit more of an uphill battle. So. I'm not trying to say that you're going to deal with the person any differently, but just kind of have an expectation of what type of a price range they may come at you with. And if it's somebody that you just deem is not going to go for a big package, for you to spend 40 minutes talking about your two to $3,000 package, it's probably a waste of time. When in reality, you just need to listen and find out what they're wanting to do. You know, there's a real easy question is, what are you anticipating spending on this wedding? What are you anticipating spending on the DJ? What are you anticipating spending on the videographer? What's most important? And I, I will oftentimes ask that question because I want to be able to show them that the DJ is really important because if the wedding's no fun, you're not going to want to watch the video. 
But if the DJ is good and the wedding is great, you want to have those memories. You want to be able to go back and show children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren in years to come a high-quality, fun wedding that was shot to your great pleasure. So I generally will do that. Um, how do you dress? You know, some of this stuff has nothing to do with video at all, but has everything to do with business. And uh, being appropriately dressed, I think, is important. You know, in today's environment, you can look at me. I'm a real clean-cut guy. I don't have earrings. I don't have tattoos. And a lot of people do, and that's great if that's your thing. I don't personally want to do that, so I choose not to. But if you do, I would suggest that when you meet with your clients that you not make that be the topic of conversation. So cover your tattoos up. Take any really crazy earrings out. You know, anything that's going to draw attention to you and away from the bride and groom, uh, I think you need to remove them. I, I don't think you need to wear clothing that shows a huge cleavage or guys need to show a bunch of chest hair. You know, dress appropriately for business. You don't have to wear a button down and a tie, but at the same token, you know, a nice polo and khakis is probably appropriate or at least something of that, that nature. You want to be comfortable. You don't want to be uptight. You want to have the environment where you're meeting be comfortable. A lot of times meeting the client at a Starbucks is, is something that's okay. If you have an office, you know, that's great too. A conference table is a perfect place to meet. You know, sit your clients in a comfortable location, offer them something to drink and something to eat as they come in so that they're welcomed and they feel comfortable around you. Because if they feel comfortable with you in this uh, interview process where you're trying to get hired, then they're going to give good interviews and you're going to get quality film when you're actually on the shoot because they feel comfortable around you. A bride or a groom that are uptight, that don't know you, that feel very awkward about it, uh, it's not going to come across as good as if they're relaxed and they're having fun. Because you want to be able to say, hey, listen, let's set this shot up. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then be cooperative as opposed to them not really liking you because you don't suit their fancy. All righty. Um, let's take a pause for just a second. I'm 30 minutes in. And uh, I'll come back in a minute and talk about some of the, the things to avoid. Be right back.